Good morning, everyone. Happy Nowruz, happy holiday season. We had this talk about a few weeks ago, and we had a few slides left to continue. It was about a view of radiological features of some of the interstitial lung diseases. First of all, I remind you all to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't not subscribed yet. Uh, all the talks are there. Uh, in the last time, we talked about different kinds of uh, interstitial lung diseases, including sarcoidosis, inhalational lung disease, lymphangitic carcinomatosis, drug-induced ARDS, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, pneumo PCP, pneumosis, pneumonia, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, and we reached about uh, tuberculosis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. <clears throat> Just a quick review for the last few uh, Last slides, we see this is about sarcoidosis. We talked about bilateral symmetrical hiral lymphadenopathy, which is, it is highly suggestive of sarcoidosis. Other differential diagnosis possible is lymphoma. However, if it is symmetrical, sarcoidosis is uh, first priority. <clears throat> and we talked about the different kind of distribution of the nodules, whether they are random, they are centrilobular, or perilymphatic, and how they are distributed. Uh, in sarcoidosis, it's an a perilymphatic pattern, like we see here, and you can see it here also. Okay. Uh, the fibrosis in sarcoidosis and its uh, typical distribution starts in the upper middle lung zones, and you can see these different kinds of nodules. This is a case uh, associated with consolidation and lymphadenopathy. This is just a quick review of what we talked about earlier. You will see it uh, in the previous video. Okay. This is the case of miliary TB where there is random distribution of the nodules. There is no specific pattern. And this is of a case, uh, case of uh, hypersensitivity in pneumonitis. There are ill-defined centrilobular nodules. You can see here and here. It's in the center of the lobule. And in sarcoidosis, it's a, a perilymphatic pattern. Pneumoconiosis, we said that there are a lot of different kinds of uh, pneumoconiosis, fibrotic and non-fibrotic. Uh, the One of the most famous ones is the silicosis. Uh, and uh, the distribution of silicosis in the subtrilobular and subplural pattern, like here and here. Sorry? Ah, oh, sorry. Okay, and this is a case of silicosis, you can see it here, associated, obviously, and one of the very differentiating findings in silicosis is the actual calcification in the nodule, uh, in the lymph node, sorry, okay, <clears throat> this is a case of sil uh, silico tuberculosis. it's about 25% of patients with silicosis, they have also TB. So it's a very uh, common association between silicosis and TB. Okay. Again, you can see here, this is what we call a PMF, progressive massive fibrosis. It's bilateral mass-like lesions in association with eggshell calcification uh, in the lymph nodes. It's a common finding in silicosis. Again, co-worker pneumoconiosis, another pneumoconiosis. Uh, you can see there are small well-defined nodules in the middle and upper lung regions. We talked about all of this in details in the previous talk. Asbestosis is, is another kind of pneumoconiosis. However, it's different from the rest in that asbestos is heavy. So it goes down into the lung, affects the middle and lower lung zones rather than the upper. Okay. Uh, Berylosis is a rare kind of pneumoconiosis, uh, we, we very rarely see it, uh, like for example in this case. Lymphangitis carcinomatosa, we have different kinds of interstitial pattern here. You can see the uh, interlobular septal thickening in addition to the mass in the hilum. Again, lymphangitis carcinomatosa, it's different from cardiogenic pulmonary edema in that the uh, ground glass 
pattern in the concatenation of pulmonary edema is more prominent. Uh, regarding cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you can see the thickening of the interglobular septa. It's usually radiating from the hilum outward, and, uh, and there is some interstitial fluid resulting in ground glass pattern, in addition to the interglobular septa thickening, plus the history, of course, the clinical history. Uh, regarding ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome can be due to many causes like aspiration, pneumonia, toxic inhalation, pulmonary contusion. You can see here uh, this patient develops ARDS as a case of after pneumonia, resulting in this pattern, it's, uh, has, has having a patchy distribution of the lung disease. There are some extra pulmonary risk factors including sepsis, pancreatitis, multiple blood transfusions, trauma, and use of drugs such as heroin. You can appreciate uh, this, for example, in this case, there is a gradient from anterior to posterior. When the patient is lying on his back, the ground glass pattern is less anteriorly and more posteriorly due to the gravitational effect. When he lies on his back, the fluid will go down. Okay. The consolidation what that develops is it's to protect the, that part of the lung. The, the part that injured goes into consolidation just to protect it and allow it for time to heal. And then it will heal itself and goes back to a relatively good way, a good shape. Let's say, for example, here, obviously, this part of the lung is consolidated, okay, to protect it from the injury, okay? And after treatment, it goes back to normal, except for this part, the bronchiectatic part, it's still some bronchiectatic changes. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is just some, let's say, sort of allergy, okay? Due to current exposure to some allergy, uh, there are multiple centrilobular ill-defined nodules all over the lung with history of constant exposure to some type of allergy. Uh, you can detect air trapping by doing both inspiratory and expiratory uh, CT scan, and you can detect the areas that are of the same density on both, this indicates air trapping. They should not be the same density. When we expire, the lung should be a higher density. Like, for example, this part and this part, this is higher density. Okay? This is a normal part, while this part is the same density as this part, indicating air trapping. Now, we reach this slide, the tuberculosis. We have primary and secondary TB. TB is initial infection with consolidation, adenopathy and the pleural effusion. This is the primary infection, just like a pneumonia, okay? While secondary TB, or what's called post-primary or reactivation TB, is due to the reactivation of the initial infection. The patient had previously an infection, and it went dormant, and then it was reactivated due to any factor. Usually located in the apical segment, this is the kind that we are commonly seeing that we commonly see is the secondary or post-primary or reactivation TB. The primary, we don't, we, we don't see it because we confuse it with pneumonia. Patients commonly present with airspace of pacification, consolidation, we consider it as a pneumonia, and that's it. So, it's usually located in the apical segments of the upper lobe. It can have cavitation. And all the classic findings that we know about, we'll talk about it in a minute, we see it in the secondary TB. Okay? The endobronchial spread of the TB may occur in both primary and secondary TB. Uh, when the infection is not contained, sometimes there is hematogenous spread of TB, resulting in what's called miliary pattern. May occur also, again, in both primary and secondary TB when the infection is not contained. So you have either miliary TB or you can have endobronchial spread. What are the findings? The HRC, the high-resolution CT scan findings in TB, in the primary TB can present as a consolidation anywhere. Lymphadenopathy, pleural effusion, regress. It's just like pneumonia. Airspace of ossification, consolidation, post lymphadenopathy, some pleural effusion. It heals and might leave some calcified lung nodules, calcified ipsilateral lymph nodes. And then the secondary TB will come after many years later, results in consolidation in the upper, upper, apical segment of the upper lobes or superior segments of the lower lobes. 
with complication. This is due to secondary TB. The patient had a previous TB infection, and now he is presented with reactivation of the TB. The endobronchial spread resulting in tree in bud appearance. What do we mean by tree in bud appearance? Small centrilobular nodules, soft tissue attenuation, connected to multiple branching linear structures of small calibers originating from a single star, just like a tree with budding at the end, with small flowers at the end. Okay, this is tree in bud appearance due to endobronchial spread. Miliary TB is defined as innumerable two to three millimeter nodules with random distribution. This is a key word. Random distribution. It has no specific pattern everywhere. Okay? For example, if we see this case now, this is typical miliary TB. Okay? You can see multiple, innumerable, diffuse all over the lung. Tiny, tiny, tiny nodules, two to three millimeters. This is miliary TB. Miliary, it's from the word millet. Millet is like this food they give to bear, the small, I don't know. Okay, uh, just small seeds that they give to birds, this is called millets. So, miliary TB is this pattern. In order to understand tree in bud appearance, which is due to endobronchial spread, first you have to know what's tree in bud. This is tree in bud. It's a branch with multiple buds on both sides. Okay, you can see it in this example the endobronchial spread of TB. There is bronchial wall thickening. You can see. These are bronchi, the small black ones, okay, with mucoid impaction and contiguous branching bronchioles. You can see here, it's like a bud with multiple, uh, a branch with multiple buds on the sides, just like a tree branch budding, okay? This is called tree in bud pattern. Another, maybe the last cause of uh, interstitial lung pattern is chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Chronic xenophilic pneumonia is, is an idiopathic condition due to filling of the alveoli with eosinophils. The alveoli gets filled with eosinophils. Peripheral consolidation with upper lobe predominance. This is the most important part. It's peripheral, it's in the upper. Okay? Usually presents in young people. For example, in this case, there is almost exclusive subpleural distribution of the consolidation. You can see here. This part of the lung is normal. The middle and central zones of the lung are The abnormalities are peripheral in distribution. Here, subpleural pattern. Okay? This is due to eosinophilic pneumonia. The alveoli are filled with eosinophils. Why? We don't know. It's an idiopathic condition. Okay? Regarding PCB pneumonia, uh, the recent name for it is uh, Pneumocystis gerovici pneumonia. It's an opportunistic infection. In immunocompromised patients, most commonly, it's seen in patients with AIDS. In fact, some people consider it like a diagnostic of AIDS. When you see someone with PCP, you have to exclude HIV top differential. Okay? What do we expect to see in PCP? Very high level, diffuse ground glass opacification. Sometimes thickened septal lines are associated with area of, of ground glass, and later there will be cysts or nematocils in about 10 to 35 percent of patients. Up to a third of the patients, they will have multiple air cysts, nematocils, cysts filled with air, typically involving the upper lobes. After therapy, they, the lesions will regress, resulting in either complete disappearance or some residual nodules or scar. Pneumothorax can happen in up to a third of the patients with the nematocytes. Thus, the air cyst will rupture, resulting in uh, spontaneous pneumothorax. For example, you can see here there is a patchy distribution of the ground glass opacity in patients with PCP. Okay? Patients with a non case, non immune compromised case. Okay? You can see here ground glass opacification. No specific pattern, it's just patchy, bilateral distribution, okay? The possibility of PCP should be considered if there is history of HIV, it will be highly suggestive of opportunistic infection. Okay, now, in this case of PCP, there is what's called crazy paving appearance, which is a bilateral ground glass attenuation. 
with sharp demarcation between normal and abnormal parenchyma. Okay, you can see here there is a sharp line, for example, here like that. It's very sharp between the normal and abnormal line. That's what's called crazy paving. What do we mean by crazy paving? This is the crazy paving pattern. These are the stones for the streets. They, you can see them in uh, Qara'a here. And in Europe, it's very common to have the streets of the markets with this uh, kind of paving. Okay, the crazy paving. The same pattern is here. It's very nice looking, in fact. It looks nice. Sharp demarcation between normal and abnormal line. However, the patient is not, uh, does not consider it nice. He's very sick. This is very suggestive of either some sort of yeah, interstitial lung disease, parenchymal lung disease. Uh, for example, xenophilic pneumonia can cause this pattern. Uh, Alveolar proteinosis can cause this pattern. And TCP can cause this pattern. You should keep it in mind. It has a, its own differential diagnosis. Okay? Again, multiple air cysts. Here, here, here. Nematocils. If this ruptured my result in uh, spontaneous pneumothorax. Okay? And you can see some interlobular septal thickening. It's patchy. It's no specific pattern. It's distributed all over. Okay? There are some drug-induced interstitial pneumonias. This, I think, we should know about more because, unfortunately, in our society, it's getting more and more common. The drug abuse. I think the guys in family medicine might help us here. They, the drug addiction is getting more and more and out of control. So, there are a lot of different kinds of drugs that cause this interstitial lung pattern regarding the, the narcotics like heroin and things like that also might cause uh, interstitial lung pattern. <coughs> might be in form of uh, usual interstitial pneumonia, non-specific inter uh, interstitial pneumonia, can cause discommative interstitial lung disease, or organizing pneumonia even can result in lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, diffuse alveolar damage, different kinds of treatments. Chemotherapy is a very common cause of interstitial lung pattern. We should know that. Okay. For example, here, diffuse alveolar damage. There is diffuse bilateral ground glass opacification. And if you don't know what do we mean by ground glass opacification, that's increased in the lung density. However, you still can see the lung pattern through it. Okay. Here, you can see the lung anatomy through it. You can see this. Uh, these are the pulmonary vessels. You can see the bronchioles with abnormal density. Okay, This is ground glass. Difference from consolidation in that consolidation, it's increased density you, with, when you cannot see the lung pattern through it. Okay. This will be very, very wide. You cannot see this branching arteries and veins and bronchioles and things like that. If you cannot see it, this is airspace opacification. If you can't see it, this is a ground glass opacification. Each one has its own differential diagnosis. Okay? This patient has a danorubicin induced early stage diffuse alveolar damage. After one to two weeks, he had a chemotherapy. After one to two weeks, he developed diffuse alveolar damage in both lungs. And this is another case of diffuse alveolar damage one week after biliomycin. Okay, you can see here also some ground glass pattern with interstitial fibrotic pattern. This is another case of then Christine non specific interstitial pneumonia. Okay, you can see increased lung density bilaterally, diffusely, and with the HRCT, you can see very marked, diffuse, reticular, reticulorodular pattern, both lungs indicating diffuse alveolar damage. Come on. Of course, we cannot make this diagnosis without proper clinical history. The clinical history will be of primary importance. If we don't know that this patient has some sort of malignancy, let's say chemotherapy, he developed respiratory distress, after the chemotherapy, we will never be able to suspect. So, radiology is a clinical pattern, clinical science, not a pure science. If we don't have the clinical notes, the lab, the previous history, previous treatment, previous surgery, previous I don't know what, you cannot help with giving the proper diagnosis, or at least suggest the proper diagnosis. This is a 60-year-old woman with non-small cell lung cancer treated with carboplatin and vinoribeline. You can see 
multiple bilateral diffuse areas of ground glass opacity more prominent in the uh, you can see this mass in the left one globe ground glass reticular opacities and after a while you can see the mass is more markedly improved due to the effect of the chemotherapy okay however the interstitial pattern persists due to this is the damage okay Amiodarone is a drug induced uh, used uh, for treatment of cardiac arrhythmias. It is deposited in the lungs. It can cause different types of interstitial pneumonitis, including non specific interstitial pneumonia, diffuse alveolar damage, and organizing pneumonia. Because it contains high iodine, it has a high attenuation value on CT. This is the most important thing. When you see some sort of abnormality on non contrasted image, without contrast, but it has a high density. It's not calcification, it's just high density, just like the thyroid. Thyroid gland or non contrasted CT scan usually will show a high density because it contains iodine. Iodine, we use it as a contrast medium. Okay? Amiodarone contains a high amount of iodine. So it will result, it will deposit in the lung, giving a high density pattern. Okay? There will be increased liver and spleen attenuation also. Can help you to. Say this is an amiodarone. For example, you can see here there is focal homogeneous opacity in the upper lobes. Here, this is 71 year old with refractory ventricular arrhythmia and cough. Received amiodarone. You can see there is some sort of ill defined mass here, ill defined mass here. On the CT scan, notice that it is not non contrast CT. There is no IV contrast. However, this mass it appears dense. It's not a calcification, definitely this is not a calcification. It's just a soft tissue mass that is dense. Okay? This suggests amiodarone deposition in the lung. There is no other explanation. Okay? And you can see here, there is increased density of the liver on this non-contrasted CT scan. Again, it's without contrast. The liver should be almost the same as the spleen. You can see the difference here. Usually, you see both of them, liver and spleen increase. However, this in this case was only the liver. Okay? Increased density indicating the amiodarone is deposited in the lung, in the spleen, in the liver, and he has side effects of amiodarone. Okay? This is not a malignant lesion. This is not an infection. This is not some sort of uh, weird uh, uh, clinical syndrome. It's just amiodarone deposited in the lung. So, without having proper clinical history, it will be very helpful for us to say to the clinician, this is can be due to amiodarone. Keep it in mind. Okay? This was our presentation. Now we are finished. Thank you very much. Don't again don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you want to see more videos. And thank you for your nice attendance.